Welcome back everyone. I hope you had a pleasant break and are feeling ready. We're now going to begin our closing plenary session and I am extremely happy to be introducing the final speakers of the day for this closing plenary, Sinem Sonsat Hegelheimer and Stephanie Link. Sinem received her PhD degree in Applied Linguistics and Technology from Iowa State University in 2017. She's the editorial assistant of the Journal of Second Language Pronunciation and the chair of SPLIS of TESOL International Association. CNEM's research interests include pronunciation teaching, materials evaluation and development, and computer-assisted language learning. She published her work in TESOL Quarterly, CATESOL and the Routledge Handbook of English Pronunciation, as well as Pronsig's own journal, Speak Out. Stephanie Link is an Associate Professor of TESOL and Applied Linguistics and Director of the Second Language Writing Programme at Oklahoma State University, OSU, where she teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in technology-mediated language learning, second language writing and writing for publication. She also serves as an equity advocate at OSU and chairs an equity committee on anti-black racism in English studies. In her role as the AEL newsletter editor, she continues her mission to promote a unified community dedicated to inclusivity, equality and diversity. Sinem and Stephanie are here today to talk about owning your teacher identity in the age of global English pronunciation teaching. Ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gemma. Um, so we would like to welcome every one of you guys. Thank you so much for staying till the last presentation of the day. And we would like to thank to the organizers of this wonderful, very first time online Pranzik conference. And uh, we have seen very great presentations today. We attended um, most of them and we were really happy to be part of those. Thank you so much to the people who presented so far. And um, we're so happy that Pranzik chose to talk about equity and inclusion in this conference. This is very valuable and we're very delighted to be part of this conference. So thank you so much for inviting us. Now, as you can see in our title, we're going to talk about teacher identity, but that being said, I would also like to say that Steph and I have human babies and cat babies and dog babies. So if you hear any um, baby cry, cat meow or dog barking that will be coming from us. So please accept our apologies in advance. So my name is Sinam Sonsat and Jim already mentioned um, everything about me, but I would like to emphasize that I'm also a fellow Pranzik member. And I'm very proud of being part of this community. And um, I'll be talking to you soon again. Thank you so much. Steph, the floor is yours. Yeah, and thank you also for the nice introduction, Gemma, and to all the organizers and attendees. Uh, today, we are just really excited to be approaching this theme of equity and inclusion from the perspective of teacher identity and global English language teaching. So specifically today, we're going to be addressing this these pressing concerns, and I say pressing because they're very timely, especially now, but they have been for years, decades, and we're still trying to figure out how to address concerns about equity and inclusion. And we're going to do that hopefully by drawing on real voices and real experiences. So if there's ever a moment where you're like, oh, I want to share this, please leave a comment in the chat box or the Q&A because your voices are, are so integral to understanding the concerns in the field. But to understand these concerns, we really need to be talking about native speakerism. Isms alone are a major concern, but today we're concentrating on native speakerism and specifically how to dismantle native speakerism. We're gonna be looking at that from the angle of history, from privilege and from marginalization. From there, we'll transition to the role of establishing a pronunciation teacher identity. Uh, specifically, we want to look at how we can take actionable items. You know, a lot, it's, it's really easy to say this is what should be done, this is what could be done, but then actually doing something is, is what we oftentimes lack, that action. So we are going to be talking about this from the role of Oh, construction. 
co-construction, beliefs about pronunciation teacher identities by pulling from some of our findings from our research. And then I'll switch over to Sina, who will talk about what really matters in pronunciation teaching. From there, we are going to learn about how to own our identity. So not only co-construct it, but then own it. And we're going to be providing some suggestions, specifically raising self-awareness through reflection and awareness of accentedness and comprehensibility in the framework of intelligibility, intelligibility. And then establishing a global English language teacher foundation. If you are not familiar with GELT, Global English Language Teaching. Today's the day to become familiar with it because really the current state of our field and we need to think about how we can push onward and upward. Uh, partial ways of doing that is being an advocate and Sina's gonna be talking exactly about that. And again, throughout today, it's an open discussion. So please leave your questions, leave your comments and we're just really excited to hear, hear about your experiences and hear about your voice. So with that said, we've already tried to gain some of your perspective, some of your experiences through Twitter. Uh, please take a look you know, at Twitter or again, responding to the chat here because uh, we have some questions. Actually, there's three questions that we posted today. We'll be posing them again throughout our presentation in order to make this a little bit more interactive. Uh, but this first one was the question of, have you or someone you know experienced inequality in pronunciation teaching? Question mark. So uh, what's really interesting, and I think that this was very much expected, is that we saw like 100% of you, 100% of you have experienced this. In fact, we were very motivated to take a Twitter platform for this presentation because there has been a very recent hashtag that went out, um, started by Hugh Deller. I don't know, I don't think he was here today. I didn't see him on the, the list, but if you are, shout out to you. Um, he started this hashtag and native speaker privilege. And the, this hashtag formed uh, a nice discussion that exposed potentially some dark sides to our field. So even though, these tweets are public. I just wanted to say that we decided to keep them anonymous in our presentation. Uh, but these stories are all too familiar and all too common not to share. So I don't want this to be as like erasing your voice. If you want to read more about it, look up the hashtag um, and native speaker privilege on Twitter. But here's one experience. This writer said, it is just disgusting to see publicity of some schools advertising their native speakers as if it was a kind of qualification. The worst thing is that it ends up being successful and having many students. I've seen this, it happens all too often, right? Um, not just in the US or the UK, but globally, global issue. And apologies for the quality here, but a couple of days ago, my employer told me I need to say I were half British if I wanted to attract more students. In other words, lie about my nationality. I say that it was against my values and refuse, or I said that, but this whole conversation almost made me cry. And in fact, seeing this tweet also makes me really sad and I hope that it disturbs you also. I hope that it makes you feel bad because we need to feel this sort of empathy for these individuals who have experienced this in order to have the desire to move forward, the desire to make action to move forward. So these, this sort of conversation is ongoing yet. Uh, last year, or I guess a couple years ago now, when Sinem and I published a study about native speakerism, I had somebody who just happened to be a native speaker, um, a male, and white, say to me, is native speakerism still an issue? I think that based off of many of our experiences, based off of what we hear from Twitter and, and what you might be saying in the chat, which I don't have the chat open, but um, it is, absolutely. Native speakerism is an issue, but 
what we need to do is figure out how to dismantle isms. Today's talk is about native speakerism. And we do this from the perspective, um, or how do we do this, is first recognizing that isms do exist. I think we're in a very open field, like we are very forward thinking, right? But we still have, you know, this person who said this to me is somebody in our field. And so we still see that. We still see the perspective of, does it really exist? Yes, we need to help acknowledge or help push forward this perspective that yes, it does exist. Because if we're in denial of it, it's not, we're not gonna be able to move forward. And then um, the perspective that it's no longer a problem. So, okay, maybe it exists, but is it really a problem? Yes. And we have lived experiences, voices of the field that can solidify the fact that it actually does exist and it is a problem. So how do we dismantle isms? One of the first steps or one way to start this is to learn from history and build on history. So the language teaching profession, as we all know, is just it's decades long, right? We're proud of that. We're, we've been here for a while, but that doesn't mean that we've always done things in like a forwardly, progressively upward progression, right? There's been some, um, and as in any historical event, there's always something that really drives a paradigm shift. In our field, um, one of the first times where the role of native, the native speaker was talked about was from Chomsky in 1965, where Chomsky claimed that there's this idealized native speaker. Right, the idea that a native speaker is the authority of a language and the only one who can characterize sentences as grammatical. Right, so look, this is the ideal informant regarding grammatical judgments. But now, globally, our nations are often confronted, like I said, with these impactful points in time that change the current and future ideology. This just happens to be one of them, but it really has impacted our, impacted our field uh, quite negatively. And we are still fighting against this, right? It's impacted our theory and our research. For example, if we're trying to have this gold standard, oftentimes and historically, we looked at native speakers as that gold standard. Um, publishing. There's a lot of bias that happens in the publishing field. And one of the, I think it was Vijay in the, in the presentation before us that talked about this. Materials development, how there's a lot of native speaker um, examples coming from native speakers. Assessment, teacher education, hiring practices. So we are fighting against all of the, this impact from back in history where we thought of this idealized native speaker. Fortunately though, the decades following this idealized native speaker perspective, we start to see global Englishes form. The idea that English is being nativized by billions, billions of individuals around the globe, right? From a plethora of contexts, from diverse populations, this era is hailing from users of varying linguistic, cultural, national, ethnic, racial backgrounds. This is so, this is what's so unique about our language. So at that point, much of the research in our field begins taking on this critical critical lens, right? Thankfully, this critical lens that urges the field to move beyond finally, beyond this native speaker construct. So the International TESOL organization steps in with this uh, newfound interest group, a caucus of non-native English speaking teachers of TESOL is how it's framed. And they were largely led by uh, George Brain, who together, they wanted to celebrate experiences, exactly what we're trying to still do today, celebrate experiences, scholarship, professionalism, right? Any of these activities that are meant to seek, um, to identify, to address inequalities. 
inequality specifically in our field. So this movement now has actually broadened. Before it was, it was about non-native English speaking teachers of TESOL, and we've taken that movement, we've broadened it. It's now all non-native English speaking teachers in our field. And they have impacted, like I've sort of mentioned, scholarship and professional activities, but also status of non-native English speaking teachers, their position, positions in organizations like ProSIG, um, and advocacy, right? So they have argued for establishing like institutionalized structure to confront this native speaker fallacy, right? But now since then, native speakerism still exists, right? So today, even though we're making movements, there is still concerns. And that's where we lead ourselves today to the global English language teaching, which CNAM is gonna talk about a little bit later, but if we understand now where we have come from, we can begin to dismantle isms or native speakerism, but we still need to do more than just understand history. So here is where we should begin to recognize and understand privilege. So privilege is very much context dependence, right? So you're privileged if you're a native speaker, right? We can't disregard that. But also native speakers can experience bouts of privilege. So maybe they're, they're native but not local, a local, local variety. They're native but not a prestigious variety or they're native but not the US or UK variety. So depending on the context that you're teaching in, there could be some bouts of privilege. But there's also privilege related to um, pronunciation, so our, our field. So in relation to pronunciation research, both language groups may be uncomfortable with teaching pronunciation. I am a native speaker, and the first time I taught pronunciation, I was uncomfortable. This is because there are other privileges that are out there, not just language background, but also we might have privilege because we've received specific training, you know, I feel very privileged to have received training from Dr. John Levis. He taught me what I know about pronunciation. Um, adequate materials that are representative of our diverse language speakers, right? Confidence, experience, the ability to perceive sound and prosody. That's a privilege. Not all of us are able to do that um, or do it to a high standard, if there are standards. Um, to command phonological features and knowledge of assessing and monitoring language, right? So if we have these privileges, any of these, one or more of these, we should think about how to share these privileges. To dismantle native speakerism, how can we share our experience with others to a, to a dismantle? From there though, if we can do this, if we can understand our own privilege and share that experience with others, we can be more empathetic and uplifting of marginalized groups, right? If you are from a marginalized group, you may have had one or more of these um, sort of ideologies. For example, many marginalized groups experience this syndrome. Well, I am not a native speaker, right? Where they don't feel like they belong in front of the classroom. Or imposter syndrome, like every day I was just texting, <laughs> seeing them, imposter syndrome, right? We all experience this. Catching a cold metaphor. You can read our, our text about this, where the idea is that students, but even parents, even parents believe that having a native speaking teacher, native English speaking teacher would somehow result in like a greater improvement of pronunciation by catching, like catching a cold through exposure, right? That's what people think. So having empathy for this and moving beyond this, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this later, hiring discrimination. 
empathizing with this, making changes towards this, and then native versus non-native binaries. This happens so often, not only in research, but also in practice, where we're using native speakers or native speakerism as a yardstick to measure quality. So if we understand how so many other people are perceiving us, perceiving our field, perceiving this idealized native speaker or this idealized pronunciation teacher, we can then think about the next step, right? The next step beyond understanding history, beyond uh, understanding privilege and experiencing or sharing our privilege with those marginalized groups, we can then, that's more of like the outside, right? Now we can begin thinking about ourselves. So we have this understanding, this broader conceptualization of how to dismantle native speakerism. We can now argue for the need to have actionable items that starts with establishing a pronunciation teacher identity or identities. So uh, I wanna take like a quick little break here, not like actually, but you all were asked this question on Twitter. I wanna give an opportunity for you to share some of your thoughts in the chat box about hmm, what characteristics make up a good pronunciation teacher. Um, Share your thoughts about this and we'll take a look and see them. If you see something that pops out, please share. But, but yeah, let's take a look. What do you all think? So we have teachers who are good listeners. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. Good. Someone, How about two more? Someone who understands SLA, second language acquisition, and awareness of sounds and phonology. Okay. All right. Also, very this one is very important before you move on. Makes mistakes and um, laughs and shows students. That's cool. Yes, very good. So we're going to start to acknowledge that, you know, all of these, if sometimes we're we know that we're a good listener, but not in all contexts. Sometimes we know we can be silly, but others of us were just like, I'm not funny. I am not funny. I tell my students that if you want me to be funny, I'm not gonna be funny, but I can be nice. I can be empathetic, right? So all of these characteristics begin to help us co-construct identity. Identity is co-constructed, but that's challenging, right? Because all of you are saying, this is what a uh, good pronunciation teacher is. This is what, this is what, this is what. Other people are saying, oh, it's a native speaker. So then we're thinking as pronunciation teachers, well, what should I be? Who should I be? How should I discover who I am? This is a challenge, right? Well, identity is co-constructed. We, we have to understand that. And for historically, identity has been constructed through these binaries, but we have to stress that it should be constructed beyond these binaries. I think that, you know, outside of this conference, when we're talking to other professionals, they might say, oh, my identity is native or non-native. And they might just, you know, I'm a native speaker. We need to go beyond that. Who are you? You're a non-native speaker. Who are you? Tell me more. Native or identity is, however, contextually complex. So while I'm trying to construct my identity, I may have all of you saying, here are my beliefs, here are my beliefs. This is what makes a good pro pronunciation teacher. This is what, this is what. We have students, we have teachers, right? So it's contextually complex both in and beyond the classroom, which means that there's a big challenge. There's a challenge of overcoming how others perceive us in, in, this, in this goal of establishing an identity. So for example, research has shown that native or non-native English speakers are affected because of pro proficiency in the student's L1, knowledge of the student's learning difficulties. We've seen this in research. Um, native speaking teachers are affected because of good 
English proficiency, ability to facilitate students' learning, right? But in addition to these rather positive beliefs, there are also beliefs out there that are discriminatory beliefs, right? And these discriminatory beliefs um, can learn to lead to inequalities. So for example, Sinem and I have a study in this book, Native and Non-Native Teachers in English Language Classrooms. And we sent out a survey to students in Turkey where Sinem is from and um, 91 students of English as a second language where we were studying at the time. And we surveyed and interviewed them. We surveyed them about their beliefs towards uh, pronunciation teachers. And then we also assess their perception of native versus non-native speech samples. So we have read and free speech samples, and we ask them to evaluate those samples based off of accentedness and comprehensibility, right? So this is just like a very skim through methodology or um, slim down methodology. But what we found is interesting because both groups, which we, ex we hoped was that both groups did in fact favor teachers who were knowledgeable about pedagogical practice, right, and had teaching experience. Both groups opted for a native speaking teacher, however, for pronunciation focused classrooms. Interesting, right? But take a look at this next part. This is what's more interesting. They favor the native speaking English teacher, even though both groups could not distinguish native versus non-native speech. Statistically, there was no significance between their distinction of accentedness and comprehensibility. So the question might be, well, what if one teacher is actually more effective? We studied that also. So in our TESOL quarterly 2016 article, we asked two questions. Raiders' judgments of students' accentedness and comprehensibility, how similar were they when the teacher was native versus non-native, right? And then how did they evaluate their effectiveness? So in these two classes, one by a native teacher, myself, one by CNAM, non-native, we both have very similar characteristics, but we're culturally indistinct, right? So we taught these students across seven weeks. We did a post, pre and post uh, test with read and free speech samples. We interviewed them and we had native speaking students rate their comprehensibility and accentedness of these students. Very quickly, we found that there was no difference based off of the teacher's language background. So the native teacher and the non-native teacher were equally effective. We also found that the students rated the teachers very, very similarly, right? Overall, great ratings across the board. The next one, very friendly, very energetic, enthusiastic, approachable, organized, same, both teachers. But they still preferred a native speaking teacher. So where am I going with this? Students' beliefs are a significant barrier, right? They're a significant barrier to acceptance. Students' willingness to express a preference for a native speaker reflects this, this native speakerness or nativeness principle over intelligibility, which we would argue is, is more important, right? And yes, it is co-constructed identity, but we need establishing identity to start with us. We can do that by, this is easier said than done, by overcoming bias and discrimination. We can think of ourselves as transnational, transcultural, translinguistic. We can think of our identity based off of race, race ethnicity. Um, we can focus on intelligibility and experience, for example, seeking out training or offering training to others. And we can know what truly matters to pronunciation teachers. Right, so I'm going to actually stop sharing at this point and um, let Sinem share her screen. Thank you, Steph. Maybe. There you go, Sinem. Okay, let me know if you guys see my 
PowerPoint. Okay, when I get started. Do you see okay? Perfect. All right, I'll have the chat box here too so that I can see your comments. All right, so Steph introduced us uh, some of the most important issues that are going on. And in fact, we've been talking about all of these all day long at this wonderful conference. So we have these three questions on the slide. And these are the questions I'm sure that you guys heard many times before. So, but I know that a lot of native English speaking teachers already thought about these questions because they were either asked about them at some point or they have to teach pronunciation of their own native language. So they have to think about these. But I would mostly like our non-native English speaking teachers, in other words, native speakers of other languages to think about these questions. Because um, the reason that I'm asking you to do this is to see if anything in your perspective changes when you think about, um, when you flip the coin and think about you being the native speaker. Because I can tell as a non-native speaking teacher that most of the time we might be stuck in the non-native speaking English teacher position and think everything or evaluate everything from that perspective. Now, if we flip the coin and think about that we are the uh, native, native speaking teachers of our own languages, how confident would you guys feel about teaching the pronunciation of your language? Or are you equally knowledgeable about the sound or prosodic system of your language? So what do you think about this? It really matters to think about these questions, right, from your own perspective as native speakers of other languages. Any, any thoughts? Have you ever thought about teaching your um, own languages pronunciation? What does it make you feel like? I know nothing about Greek phonology and prosody, says Wiki. I don't know anything about Turkish phonology either, Wiki. I hear you, okay. All right, I follow the classical direction. Yes, I thought I was not prepared to do it. Okay, so big fat no to all three questions. So I hear you all and I agree with all of you and I would feel the same way. If anybody asked me to teach English pronunciation right now, I would be in. But if they asked me to teach Turkish pronunciation, I would be very reserved and I would rather prefer a colleague of mine, native or non-native speaker of Turkish, to teach it if they have the training to teach Turkish pronunciation. So this is a very important point to reflect from the perspective of native speakers and as you being the native speakers of other languages. Okay, so then what matters for a teacher? Actually, you guys gave really good answers to this question a couple of minutes ago, but as you all know, it only matters if you're professional in your area. And what does that mean? You have to have knowledge base, right? Like the phonology of the target language you're teaching, pronunciation features, sounds, or prosody. You need training, you need experience, or um, you need to follow the updates, the things that are happening in the area. You need to have some kind of library of your own materials and have confidence. But when I look at research about these things like training, experience, I witnessed during my dissertation research that both native and non-native English speaking teachers have issues about having training in pronunciation. In fact, one of you guys addressed earlier today that most teachers may not have training in pronunciation. So as Steph said before, when we both taught those pronunciation courses in 2013, she didn't have any experience in teaching pronunciation. I didn't either. So we didn't have experience. So we, we felt so desperate in need of help. But I thought it was because of being a non-native English speaking teacher, but seeing how Stephanie felt about it and also seeing what experience brought to me in the following years, I noticed that it wasn't really about being a non-native English speaking teacher. So I also noticed that um, in my research that teachers who follow updates, who follow research as much as they can, because as we know, not everything are accessible to teachers, but like free webinars or uh, newsletters of institutions like IATEFL or TESOL, they might be helpful for teachers and the ones who follow the, that kind of thing feel more confident. And you need to feel um, like confident in your accent, in, in your identity. It's like uh, wearing your own shoes. You should be fine because a lot of non-native English speaking teachers that I interviewed, for, again, for my dissertation, expressed that they didn't feel that they were the right model of English to present in class. So therefore, they were looking for audio materials of the textbooks or course books they use desperately. So it takes some time for some teachers to believe in themselves as uh, models for English pronunciation. So you need to have your confidence through your training and your experience, and it will just build up on um, everything one by one. So 
it doesn't mean that you cannot teach the pronunciation of any language because you're a non-native speaker of it, or you can teach it because you're a native speaker of that language. So as Stephanie mentioned a little bit, we're also going to talk about global Englishes, and global Englishes really values um, using linguistic repertoire of people, like uh, speakers. So if you guys have multiple languages, you can use all those languages in your teaching. So Global English's language teaching era doesn't approach things from a monolingual perspective. And in fact, it values every language you have, any contribution your translingual identity can bring to the picture. So I would like you to look at these, um, like uh, this conversation between two speakers on Twitter. And both of these speakers are native speakers and uh, one of them might be listening to us now. So I would like to read what she said initially. So she says, I was never taught English grammar. I first learned about tenses studying French at 11 and Italian at 13. I first encountered English grammar when I had to teach it on my Salta and panic. Today, I still look to my L2 teacher colleagues for help with unknown grammar points. And then the speaker too says, I have an English degree and work as a professional journalist, but I don't know what any tenses are, never have, is this normal? An editor asked me to take something out of the past continuous tense earlier. And I was like, I'm sorry, who? So, and the speaker one responds, one of the most important reasons why a native English speaking teacher is not by mother tongue, automatically a good teacher of English. I wish I had years of study and education, my NS colleague said. Now, the three things that I want to, or two things that I want to take your attention to in this conversa conversation is, the speaker says, I was never taught. So also, she said, I wish I had years of study and education. And these phrases bring us back to education training, not to being native speaker. Also, other things she said, I first learned about tenses studying French and then Italian, which also appreciate being translingual, because um, being translingual, also adopting global English's perspective says that uh, the more you learn in any language, they will feed into the systems of other languages you speak. So appreciating all languages your mind is dealing with, okay? So if we have issues with skills, if being a native or non-native speaker of a language doesn't make us automatically good at or bad at teaching those skills, why do we need to worry about like, oh, I can't teach grammar or I can't teach pronunciation? Do we really need a dichotomous categorization? So can we not all noun identities and be happy with that and just focus on training and, um, and knowledge? So there were, of course, some efforts by some scholars who wanted to try and change this native, spe native speaker uh, dichotomous categorization. So for instance, Pasternak and Bailey created one, and they didn't want to say non-native, non-native, but instead they used, so if a like is a speaker proficient in the target language or not or is the speaker is the teacher professionally prepared as a language teacher or not so that is the kind of continua they try to create but as we can see today there's still a lot of labeling which are bringing us back to the same point now this was the third question we asked you on twitter um, but um, if you guys want to share your opinions on here on the chat box we will come back to those like how you describe yourselves as um, teachers. And, but before that, I would like to talk about who we are as teachers, like how do we describe our identities, Stephanie and I. Now, when we look at the background of Stephanie, she grew up in a transnational household and her parents spoke English as a second language. Her mom is Vietnamese Chinese and her father is Cuban, but she never could speak Spanish when she was a child because she grew up in an English only era. And um, this is kind of, sad for um, heritage speakers, right? And then so she had to learn Spanish and Mandarin formally at school. But growing up in a family who have multiple languages, Stephanie has this translingual and transcultural identity. And she uses this um, identity in her teaching. She brings those cultures into her teaching, into pronunciation teaching or any other uh, skill that she teaches, she teaches. And she, like me, she only had to learn about pronunciation in her PhD program. She didn't have any pronunciation training before that. So she also herself said that she struggled with um, teaching pronunciation before that. So being a native speaker automatically didn't help her to teach pronunciation. Like you guys reflected a couple of minutes ago, being the native speaker of your own language may not help you to teach um, 
uh, like a language. It's just like driving a car, right? So just because you know how to drive it, you don't know how the pieces of the car come together to make the car go, right? So you need training and knowledge about that. Me, um, as a teacher, I, my first language is Turkish. So I am a native speaker of Turkish. And then I speak English and German as my um, additional languages. And I had music education when I was younger, and this was what drove me into pronunciation to melodies of languages. And that way I um, focused on prosodic features. I love pronunciation. So I use it in my teaching. And I didn't have training in pronunciation until my PhD either. So that made a difference. But uh, since our study in 2013, um, the time that Steph and I taught the pronunciation course, I've been teaching for the last seven years and I taught three um, different pronunciation courses last semester. One of my courses had 55 people. Um, and then um, I had different challenges in here in my own setting in Turkey because it was hard to teach to 55 people. You know, you try to record everyone for diagnostics and it takes time. And then in, in the US, I had a lot of students from different L1s. So that was another challenge because I didn't know quite well how to address the needs of speakers of different languages. But in time, by working on all of those issues and just um, making my library bigger, keeping just uh, updated myself updated with the research, I started to feel more comfortable. And now I am uh, producing research material, uh, teaching materials with two other pronunciation researchers. So I came from not feeling confident at all to teaching very confidently. And I'm still the same non-native speaker of English. So being non-native speaker of English was never the issue. Now I see that. So maybe we can help the others to see that with them too, being a non-native speaker is not really the issue. So now it's your turn again to think about a couple of things. Um, so these are the questions that Salvi had um, in his paper about global Englishes. And I really love these questions. So to own your identity, you need to raise your awareness through reflection your awareness for your native English speaking colleagues or non-native English speaking colleagues. Now we won't have time to look at each of these questions, but I would like to bring your attention to some of these questions. And if you would like to share your opinion on any of those, please um, use the chat box and put the number of the question as well as um, what is the NNEST or NEST category. So let's say you have professional experience and expertise in teaching all kinds of language skills as a non-native English speaking teacher, is it fair to ask you to teach only certain skills? So this is one question. Just because you're a non-native English speaking teacher, is it fair to ask you to teach only certain skills, but not the others, okay? The next question for a native English speaking teacher. Okay, I see a lot of no's, of course not, yes. You're a native English speaking teacher. You're described as a native English speaking teacher with experience and expertise, but another native English speaking teacher with no such background and credentials was given the exact same job. How would this make you feel? No credentials, no training, but this other teacher gets the job. Yes, hurts, right? So it hurts, it makes you feel outraged. Okay, so disappointed, upset, you have every right to feel so. Let's look at another question. You are described as a non-native English speaking teacher, maybe a Turkish person living in Japan, but you're not even considered for a teaching position because you're neither local nor a native English speaking teacher. How would this make you feel? So this is another question, yes, depressed. And the other question is, you are a native English speaking teacher with experience and expertise in teaching ELT, but you're not considered for a teaching position because you do not come from the US or UK. Is it still fair to argue that native English speaking teachers are, are universally privileged? So reflecting on these questions and another question actually, which is not on this list. Uh, this is the story that I experienced in my own setting, EFL setting. Um, my colleague's daughter who was born and raised in the US until she was eight, she goes to a private school here and she sometimes reports that her teacher has mispronunciation issues. So now as the parent, you're an English teacher, what do you say when it's your child, when it's the teacher of your child? So what is your reaction to your child? So think about these kinds of questions, like when it becomes 
your issue, how do you react? Do you still react rightly to speak up for both groups of teachers and based on their knowledge and training credentials? Now, another thing that we can do, and this we saw in another presentation, which was wonderful, uh, raising awareness about accentedness and comprehensibility and intelligibility. But when we're doing that, I would like you to think about this question. Are all varieties comprehensible to you at an equal rate? Now, consider both native and non-native English speaking varieties. This um, websites of idea, like the dialects of English website, has a drop down menu where you can go ahead and click and say comprehension test. And then in that test, you as a native or non-native English speaking teacher, you can listen to a North, Northern Ireland person, or you can listen to a Scottish person, you can listen to a Vietnamese person, Chinese person, all kinds of varieties of English. Now, I can foresee that a North American person may have difficulties in understanding an Irish person, or a Chinese person may have difficulties in understanding a Vietnamese person. Now, I remember a couple of people uh, commented about that in the chat box earlier. This is not only about speaking, only about the speaker. It's about the listener as well. And we know by looking at the speech perception studies that listeners or our ears get adjusted to listening to varieties of English, the more we interact with them. And um, it is very natural that we're gonna struggle with understanding some varieties in the very first time that we hear them. But in time, our ears will adjust to that as well. So it's not only about the speakers, but it's also about the listeners, the comprehensibility issue. So what the field does for this is uh, just taking um, an approach and being closer to global English's paradigm, including world Englishes, um, English as a lingua franca, where your interlocutor can be native and non-native English speaker, uh, speaking people, English as an international language, and valuing the translanguaging, like knowing the value of all languages that students bring to class. Now, what does that mean when we talk about global English as language teaching? It's a more comprehensive and pedagogical approach um, to uh, promoting inclusive norms. And instead of focusing on deviations based on native speaking standard standards, we need to focus on the co-constructed, negotiated meaning through diverse linguistic repertoires of learners in transnational communication. So global English as language teaching, GALT, goes beyond traditional borders and acknowledges instructional advantages of all teachers, right? And again, going back to what really matters, if you don't have the training or knowledge, one or the other may not really be enough for you to enjoy any advantages or any privileges you might bring from your linguistic background. So when we look at some core differences between um, ELT and GELT, you can see that ELT traditionally, ELT mostly took the native speakers as the target interlocutor and the English speaking culture was the target culture. But Gelt says, no, the interlocutors could be all of those because remember English as a lingua franca is included in this paradigm as well. So we're talking about fluid cultures. We're not talking about fixed native English culture. And we're talking about when we look at the norms, we're talking about diversity, flexibility, multiple forms of competence. And when we look at uh, like teachers, we're talking about native English speaking teachers and non-native English speaking teachers. And in GELT, these non-native English speaking teachers could have different L1s. So I, could, I should be able to teach in Japan as a Turkish L1 English teacher. So, and the role model in GELT is successful ELF users. And the most, one of the most important points is materials. So materials should include native English, non-native English, ELF, um, English. And so again, first language, own culture is seen as a source here, not as, an hind as a hindrance. And ideology is underpinning an inclusive global English's perspective. So in instead of excluding people based on being local, based on being native, non-native, uh, outsider, insider, we need to embrace all teachers. We need to be inclusive and focus on their professional qualities, credentials, their training, their knowledge. So what does it mean for pronunciation or ESL, EFL? So we talked about this many times today, but we need to include multiple varieties in the classroom, pronunciation and listening wise. And how can you do that? Like, for instance, in my own teaching at the beginning of every semester, I take multiple speakers audio samples to my class and I ask my students listen to them 
And initially, of course, as you can imagine, they giggle because they hear different people from different language backgrounds. They either understand fully or not, but I ask them to guess where these speakers are from. And then I ask them how much they understand. And then we do this like um, in every other like week and um, step by step, I can feel that my students come to the point that they understand varieties, different varieties more comfortably. And when it comes to their diagnostic themselves, recording and reflecting on their own pronunciation, they make some kind of association with those like uh, speakers that they listen to at the beginning of the semester. They just um, try to find some similarities, differences. So it, it all makes it very fun and it increases their awareness. And we also need to prioritize what matters in pronunciation teaching and remember intelligibility. You do not need to insist on like producing the TH sounds. In fact, research shows that it is disappearing from some English varieties. So yes, producing the TH sounds will just show that you are from another uh, L1 group, but it is perfectly fine. Your accent is your identity. We can focus on the things that may make a difference for meaning instead of just um, something that shows that you might have another L1. So reflecting on, reflecting on your own situation as a teacher, again, considering all your identities. Uh, remember, again, think of different scenarios. If you were the parent of a child going to school, the English teacher has some issues, what is your reflection? That will show your real uh, reaction to this issue when it's not you in the same position. Think about the hiring practices, including all teachers, not prioritizing anyone because of the, again, being local or native but also speak up to the administrative people when there's opportunity. Remind us if you're pronunciation teachers and researchers, and if you know that research says that this really doesn't matter, you, a teacher just needs to be knowledgeable, trained. So uh, focus on those things and remind them what matters. And be proud of your personal accent, whether it's a native or non-native variety, because again, it's your identity and it's beautiful. And you can teach pronunciation just fine with your personal accent. There are some barriers to um, GELT, and those are lack of materials. Unfortunately, a lot of materials do not have multiple varieties of English, but uh, I remember two good uh, Pranzig friends published a book about how to write pronunciation activities. And in that, in that book, they also talked about how hard it is to find audio sources, people who will just uh, record, will be recorded for materials, coursebook materials. So that's a kind of technical issue, but it, it is an issue in pronunciation teaching. So we need, to, we need to work on that part of it. Lack of assessment. A couple of you guys today asked about assessment, whether um, IELTS or TOEFL include varieties of English. The answer is, um, as far as I know, IELTS and TOEIC does this. And if you read this paper by Kang, Thompson, and Mor Moran, you will see uh, more detailed information, but yes, uh, they started to be at least concerned about this issue because we are raising our voice, we're speaking up, we're uh, reminding them that uh, when students go to international settings, they're gonna be talking to other non-native English speakers like native English speakers as well. So they started to have experiments about including different varieties in the test. But as far as I know so far, they only go with the inner circle um, varieties. So teacher education, not all teacher training programs emphasize this enough. An attachment to standard, uh, standard English, again, is kind of uh, still an issue. And teacher recruitment practices are still issues. But the good news is we still have some new uh, resource books or teaching books in which you can see like world English's, English varieties being included and um, or assessment considering different varieties. And yes, I can start into a song. That would be nice if I could sing it that one though. Okay, so what can you do as teachers? We all talked about what others should do today, but what can you do? Uh, we know that it might be hard to change things as an individual person, but um, if you become an active advocate of inclusion and equity, that might make a difference. Today, the opening plenary speaker talked about this. He said, uh, go public, talk about it, uh, use social media. And we agree with him because it's really important. Discuss these issues actively whenever there's an opportunity in an informative and kind manner that people can hear us. Because I had moments that I had to talk to my, uh, the, the dean of my department or the department chair to remind them what matters. Because I heard people talking about hiring only native English speaking teachers for oral communication courses in the 
English preparatory program. So when you have the background, research background, just talk about it. Produce, collect your own teaching materials. Um, use uh, other sources like IDEA or Speech Archive or Youglish. Um, or even actively send emails to Youglish to include more English varieties because right now Youglish only has US, UK and Australia. Why not more varieties, right? And then help colleagues and ask for help to create a corpus of the right, like uh, materials, including varieties of English. And lastly, remember to speak up for your colleagues, again, in an informative way, if something happens. Like I remember I came to the defense of this colleague who I do not even know the colleague who had a mispronunciation in the classroom. Um, remember the child who said the teacher had mispronunciations? So I talked about it. I said, well, anyone can have a different pronunciation or mispronunciation. It doesn't mean they cannot teach pronunciation or English. So that brings us to our final thoughts. Like we saw that we have the entire day showed us that we have concerns about equity and inclusion, and these are pervasive, but we need to learn from history. Uh, we need to recognize privilege, empathize, and uplift. We need to establish a pronunciation teacher identity to dismantle inequities and discrimination. And we need to own our own, uh, our identity, our accents. We need to raise awareness. We need to be an advocate. So we need to be actively involved in all these processes to change what's happening in the area. We need to believe in ourselves, our colleagues, native or non-native. You should not discriminate either uh, any of the groups. You cannot assume that native English speaking teachers are not trained as uh, Wayne uh, raised a few minutes ago. So speak up for all teachers. Um, speak up for yourself, own your identity, own your accent. So thank you so much for listening to us. These are our references. If you want to read more about Global Englishes, um, Galloway is a good name. If you want to read about testing, Kang, Thompson, Moran would be good names. And if you want to read about our study, uh, you can look at these studies. And McKay is a good one about English as an international language. And again, um, another study for testing and accents and testing. Or NS movement, if you want to read about it. Um, miss, uh, like conceptions or hiring practices by Salvi. And um, obviously, the, this book, Criticality, Criticality, Teacher Identity and Inequity in ELT, would be a good one in your library as well. So thank you so much uh, on behalf of both of us, and we would like to welcome your questions and comments. Thank you very, very much, Sinem and Stephanie. Um, I've been transfixed by that the entire time, and we've got some wonderful questions. If anyone else has a question, please put it in the Q&A box and we'll see how many we can get through. Um, the first one comes from, I hope I say your names right, by the way, Gada, who says, just thinking about the implications of this fantastic work for research on L2 phonetics and phonology, L2 patterns are inevitably compared to those of native or first language users, but the aim is to better understand the outcome of interaction, of language interaction in the learner's emergent accent and identity. I'd like to think about the, I'd like to think that this is still a worthwhile pursuit, but does it inadvertently maintain the native speaker ideal? That's a very good question. Well, actually anything we say carefully or not carefully may feed back into native speaker ideal, but um, looking at the interaction and learners emerging accents and identity, no, I don't think that it would necessarily maintain the native speaker ideal if we emphasize that the goal is to negotiate the meaning, um, like both speakers keeping their own developing accents or uh, pronunciation as long as the com communication goes on within the limits of their developing accents and varieties, the comparison should be how much they understand each other. Like uh, they should be fixing the negotiation understanding of each other, not necessarily needing um, a standard. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think uh, we don't have to compare to native speaker ideal all the time. We should be looking at what the goal is. The goal is communication in ELF uh, interactions or any other kind of interaction. Do you have- Yeah, to just to add to that, 
um, well, first of all, I completely agree with what Sinem is say, saying, but also, sure, this comparison is inevitable, but it needs to start with us who are the, the professionals in this field to make it less inevitable. <laughs> right? I'm a native speaker, I don't even know how to say that. Because ideally, we're not making this comparison in the future, however many years it takes now, hopefully, this comparison native versus non-native is going to stop because we're like, who is a native speaker these days anyway? So our models are now going to be compared to um, inexperienced versus experienced speakers. And okay. so once we get into that sort of movement, that paradigm, then uh, this pursuit is gonna be not for the pursuit of a native speaker, but a pursuit of an experienced or expert interlocutor mm -hmm. okay thank you for that and um, now a question from Ben and they say recruitment is clearly a barrier here these are long questions by the way so pay attention um, recruitment is clearly a barrier here but often this is informed by the market's expectations in places I've worked in the past parents threatened to take their children to another academy if their teacher was a non-native English speaker. So then hiring a non-native English speaker became so much harder. It's a chicken and egg thing, I'm sure. But what steps can we take to start this change and convince prospective students that non-native English speakers, speaking teachers are just as good as native English speaking teachers? Uh, well, thank you for the question. I think, um, again, I would say try to take their attention, people's attention to the right thing, to the professionalism. And I don't know if that would solve the issue, but maybe um, like provide examples of other non-native English speaking people from their own community who are really good teachers, um, pronunciation teachers, or even materials developers. So that might show them maybe slowly that, look, these are non-native English speaking teachers, speakers like you guys, and they're really successful at doing this. So we have a lot of people teaching pronunciation as a non-native speaker. I think people just don't know about it, and they're not really informed about intelligibility or comprehensibility. They think it matters to have a native-like pronunciation, and this is why they kind of um, emphasize that having a native English speaking teacher for their kids is a must, especially in private schools. But I think showing the good examples of other teachers who can do this regardless of the language background, might give them some ideas. But I, um, to be honest, I don't think this is going to change quickly. It's going to take time. Uh, what I believe is it's going to change if we speak up for people. And if we change, if we start changing our own perspective, thinking that that child in the private school is our child and we are perfectly fine with our child to have a non-native English speaking teacher or native English speaking teacher, as long as they have training and knowledge, that should be the thing that matters. But we need to remind that to other people too. And also if any of you have access to like marketing for IEPs, intensive English programs, yeah. there should be marketing materials that are explicitly about marketing experience teachers. We could even sponsor something like this through this interest section that we distribute to all of these intensive English programs that document um, why an experienced teacher is, is the goal, right? And use that as part of a mar marketing scheme to show that it doesn't have to be native speakers. We can be as effective, but we have to think as a unitary thought, a unitary action so that we're all expressing the same ideas and these ideals and then marketing it to these parents, to these other um, businesses that are trying to use the English profession as you know, a monetary um, goal. They, they, they think about money, right? We need to break that paradigm down. Thank you. Um, another question, um, how is JELT different from ELF? How is JELT different from ELT? Yeah. Um, do you, I can go back to the slide, but I can talk about it too. Well, JELT gives a uh, priority to all teachers, regardless of the language background. So it also emphasizes the importance of linguistic repertoire, saying that all languages 
are kind of welcome in the classroom, the languages of the students. And there are actually some really nice studies about um, JOLT, Global English as Language Teaching, where um, teachers in the classroom actively bring a lot of English varieties to the classroom to see if the attitudes change towards the end of the semester or if students listening for pronunciation, different pronunciations improve or not. So there are some research uh, studies on this now, and they're showing that um, the perceptions, attitudes change to a great extent and the students listening skills also improve compared to um, students who only listen to traditional ELT, like just one native speaker in a course book. And so in that sense, it's different that JOLT doesn't really differentiate between the language background of the teacher. It says any teacher and it also doesn't prioritize local non-native teacher in a setting, in an EFL setting. It says any teacher with the required credentials. Also materials should have a lot of varieties in JOLT. Um, and I assume that JOLT materials will have, would have more HVPT, high variability phonetic training. So speaking, um, meaning that they would have more varieties of English in their materials as well, not only non-native varieties, but also different native English speaking varieties. So it's all about bringing different varieties, making them active parts of your class and teaching in JOLT. Whereas in ELT, the target culture is English speaking culture. It is assumed that you're gonna to talk to native English speakers. They're not really, um, the ELT, traditional ELT doesn't really think that the interlocutor will be another non-native speaker or two non-native speakers talking to each other. So JOLT um, takes the implications from English as a lingua franca, English as an international language, world Englishes and embraces all of them, unlike ELT, traditional ELT. Steph, anything to add? Um, no, <laughs> I know no, I'm okay. giving into the fact that there's very little time. There's other questions. I'll keep it short. Fair enough. So um, uh, I would I would just say, you know, I think we need to get publishers to take a jelt perspective. That's yes. going to be where the big change happens. Exactly. Actually, I would like to add that uh, as a person who is working on a course book right now with two other people, we are thinking about including a lot of varieties. It will just take a lot of um, time or more time than producing maybe a book with one speaker or one variety. And um, so we're definitely gonna do that. It will just require time and money. Hopefully we can do that. So wish us good luck. But if we do, you will see that in the market in the next couple of years maybe. But yes, definitely that's the, the idea. Have multiple voices in the book and have people listen to other people reflect on their pronunciations and their own pronunciation. So we'll do that. Brilliant. And anyone doing a questionnaire for a publisher, please write, I want global English speakers in the resources because that's exactly. what will make and a big email difference Uglish. to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, another question. Um, uh, Sergio says, for this to happen, teacher trainees should be trained differently. Should phonetics teachers working in teacher training colleges worldwide be doing a different job, maybe letting go of traditional British school of phonetics and embracing a more international English slash world English's approach? Phonetic teachers, okay. Uh, Steph, do you wanna go ahead or do you want me? Yeah. So for every teacher, especially if you're taking like an ESP or EAP approach, so English for specific purposes or English for academic purposes, the core of those approaches are to ensure you do like a needs analysis. What are the needs of your students and where are they um, hoping to find themselves in the future? So if those students are needing a traditional approach to phonetics because of their, their job that they're going into, then that's what you teach. But ideally, we would both say that we would be moving into a more gel perspective. This yeah. would be ideal. Now, can every teacher know every single um, accent or even dialects that are out there? No, we can't do this. And that's why the needs-based approach is so integral. So ideally, that's what we would do. And I think I, I hope I answered that question. And I um, adding on what Stephanie said, I don't think that things will change immediately, but I also agree that we're going towards that direction anyhow. And to me personally, the biggest uh, indication is that big large scale testing companies are already 
like um, they feel obliged to work on including different varieties, seeing that this is what's happening in real authentic life. And also I started to see some materials emphasizing their product saying, we have non-native English speaker varieties or different native English speaking varieties. So I think we're going there slowly, but again, um, we need to actively um, contact some of those like people who are making decisions in these materials development area or in these test companies, testing companies, or again, websites like Youglish, just remind them to have more varieties to bring more um, differences. But again, another thing is to produce your own corpus is going to be a, something personal that you can start with, with your colleagues and use your own voice as the model voice. Don't be afraid of using your own voice, whether you are native or non-native. Because I also remember a couple of years ago, I think Gemma and I talked about this, like um, as a, for instance, Scottish speaking teacher, you might be teaching English with the materials of received pronunciation or American English. And that creates some conflict in your teaching, like my um, variety, but this is the variety that I have to use in the book. I don't feel obliged to use the, the accent of any given, you can bring your own, you can um, combine. And um, I think that's perfectly fine. It doesn't have to be general American English or received pronunciation. Thank you. So now an observation, which I suppose they're asking for you to feed in on. Aoife says, perhaps um, this is an observation rather than a question. As someone who researches teacher identity, I find it really interesting that there seems to be a correlation between perceived teacher competence in pronunciation teaching and professional identity, much more than, say, the ability to teach grammar or vocabulary. It stands to reason, I suppose, with this nest, nest dichotomy, but I find that this correlation exists regardless of the teacher's L1. Yeah, uh, I agree. And my answer to this is just based on my personal observation again, just like uh, Eva. and I'm sorry if I'm uh, butchering the pronunciation of the name as a pronunciation person, I feel really bad if I can't say the name. But um, one of the reasons could be like, um, as you know, pronunciation is not really taught to young learners much other than ESL settings. This doesn't happen in ESL settings. And we just talked about this with a couple of other colleagues and they said, why does nobody work on young learners much in pronunciation? Not many people. And then I said, one reason could be like uh, most pronunciation teachers uh, Sinem, could you repeat that, please? I think we lost you for a second. Some live in the ESL setting and they don't really get to think until people come to the college level or... I'm sorry, Sinem, I think we're going to have to... When you were learners, you is not something that probably you <laughs> Beth, maybe, would you like to jump in yes maybe i can say one thing and this is Hopefully regarding it our, will get better yeah should make it better in a little bit but um the the publications that we presented in our paper we actually asked the question to the students it wasn't only about pronunciation we asked if you are learning grammar would you prefer a native or non-native teacher where if you were learning, reading, listening, right? We asked all of those questions and they didn't have a preference. It was only for pronunciation where they were finally like, actually, I would want a native speaker. So I think that your observation is actually spot on and unfortunate, right? Sinem, thank you, Steph. Sinem, could you <laughs> recap what you were just saying? Because we lost most of it. I was just saying that there are not when you moved All on right, to young so learners. Sorry about that. I was just saying that there are not many people teaching pronunciation to young learners. Therefore, it's not something that we think until it's very 
late in the education process. So then we start comparing our competence and our knowledge, which doesn't happen with other skills because we always learned about them even at younger ages. So this might be another reason that we keep comparing our competence and our skill in that um, pronunciation. Thank you very much. Just got Sorry, one. I might be. Yeah. One. Sorry. No. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just got one more question coming up, and um, that's: um, Is there anything that you think it's important for school managers to do to support students? Sorry, to support teachers in taking a JELT perspective. Training training and we need to get that information to those school managers is that how you say it here i think we're like principals right here i mean in the united states we say school principals they don't know they're not informed i oftentimes give training to our local schools and it's not because they come to me it's because i go to them and i say this is what your teachers um might be struggling with, here's how we can approach it, what's your interest? We actually ended up completely restructuring our school systems based off of, um, or in, in order to create a whole different, not only perspective about the materials, but the approach, like who is their teacher and how, what role does that teacher have in the classroom? So from sheltered instruction to pull out instruction to having a centralized location for these resources, we completely reconceptualize what that means for our local schools. And so if we have that ability or even again, like I talked about privilege, any of those privileges like experience or a training from what we, we've given, be prepared or be willing to share that because people don't have this knowledge and they're not gonna seek it out. They have so many other issues that they're dealing with, they're not gonna seek you out. You need to seek them out. And that is, um, that's just one way. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Steph. And thank you, Sinem. It has been an immense pleasure to have you speak at the end of this wonderful day where it has been my privilege and everyone else's to hear so many good ideas on making pronunciation teaching more inclusive, respecting identities and providing global representation to the people who speak English all around the world. I'm really delighted to say that this has been an exceptionally good day for us. We have been very privileged, as I said, to, to be a part of it and to be bringing it together. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved, all of the speakers, Rob Drummond for opening it, Steph and Sinem for closing it, all of the people in between, the tireless work of the PRONSIG committee, who I think all deserve a big lie down right now, um, uh, and, um, and the computers themselves for keeping going through all of this time. Um, I've just got a little bit of information I'd like to share with you. So I'm going to share my screen now quickly. And the first thing is to say thank you to everyone for your participation in today. It's been truly amazing. And the second thing then is to say that um, uh, Pronsig is really keen for you to get involved in exactly what Steph and Sinem have just been talking about and Rob started the day with talking about as well. We'd like you to sign up, join us and get involved. Here's some of the great work that we do. We've got our webinars, which are every month, but we would like to make them more often and um, we can only do that with further help and support from other volunteers. We are all volunteers and we um, are very happy to volunteer, but we would like some other friends to help us with that. Um, we've also got the conferences that we put on. This is our annual autumn conference. Um, we have the PCE day before, um, before the main IATFL conference and um, that's on in 
June this year because of the delay due to COVID next year, sorry. Um, but we would also like to do more and not just in the UK, we'd like to do more globally as well. We've got our journals, the new one of which has just landed and you can go to IATEFL and read that right now. And it contains at the bottom here a really interesting article on exactly the topic of today um, from Robin Walker on intelligibility. And so I really recommend that. And then, of course, we've got our social media networks and we are currently looking for some new um, social media assistants to help us with this because we are getting more more um, more involved we're getting more demands on our time and we need more hands to help us with this we're really keen to develop pronunciation teaching and learning for the world which speaks it and we're really keen to get some help doing that from anyone and everyone who can offer it so if you could be, if you would be kind enough as to volunteer some help, I'm going to drop a couple of links in the chat now here for you. So if you're not yet an IATEFL PronSIG member, then there's a very easy way to fix that, which is to join PronSIG today. There's the link in the um, chat box now. You can click it now and fill it in as soon as this is over. Um, if you're in PronSIG already, but you want to get more involved, or if you want to join PronSIG and then get more involved, there's a link for that as well. You can email us on pronsig at iatefl.org and we are putting out a call very soon for people, um, an official call. So if you want to get in ahead of that and say you're interested, we can talk to you and find out where, you're fit, where you can fit in with the organization. And I've mentioned the PronSIG journal. There's if you are a member already, there's a, um, a, a link to accessing it now. Um, and if you're not a member, click that link and it will give you another reason to sign up to IATEFL. Um, we are very, very happy to, to have done this conference today. And there's one final thing which we really value more than anything else, which is your opinions and your feedback. So if I'd like to pop in the chat here, a Google Doc questionnaire, it's only one page, but it's really helpful for us in knowing what you found useful, how we can improve, and so that we can make the next event even better than this. So we're really delighted that you came today. Thank you very much. And just before we all go, I'd just like to, um, I'd just like to um, uh, ask all of the, if anyone's still alive, all of the um, uh, PronSIG team who are here to turn their cameras on and just say hello and thank you to everybody for coming today. And on my screen, Beata, me and um, Gemma are all at the top. Um, uh, I don't know, Victor, if you're there, Ivana, Sinem, Rob, no. Taylor, <laughs> are you guys there as well? Yeah. <laughs> Can I Thank just you. say this has been amazing and I don't know if all the people in the world know how much work we've put to create this event and I really appreciate I really do. Haha <laughs> I've got here <teary>, sorry that. <laughs> Thank you guys this was amazing you did an amazing job and very much work we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. We've been, as I say, I can't say it enough times, we've been delighted that you're here. Thank this, you. The voices that you have de deserve to be heard loudly. So thank you very much. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to take a little screenshot so everybody smile. Steph, great. Just in time. Ready? Three, two, <laughs> one. Hooray. Great. Thank you very much. Right. Um, Gemma, would you like to say the final words? I don't think I can top that, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely fantastic um, to, to hear everyone today and just enormous thanks. You've made a fantastic day. It really was. It was absolutely superb. And I'm amazed that we've gotten through without any technical issues. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> But um, uh, apart from a tiny, tiny bit with CNM at the end, of course, but um, uh, we'll, we'll gloss over that. But no, just um, huge thanks to everyone. Um, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, uh, yeah, when we've recovered, let's do it all again. Yeah. Okay. Next week, same time. <laughs> mm. Great.
Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you ever so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening and a great week ahead. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Okay, too, we can still see you. <laughs> ah, thank you.